Well, God bless everybody this morning. We are glad to come to you and share this teaching and bring forth revelation. Those of you who've joined us in the conference today, we're glad to have you in this opening of our classes this morning. And I'm the first teacher, and uh, we're gonna talk about something called foundations. Uh, foundations are important when it comes to anything. Uh, the scripture says, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? But foundations teaches us where something emanated from, where it came from. So we're gonna talk about foundations of praise and worship. And we're gonna be uh, coming from uh, Ezekiel 28 verses 10, uh, verses 12 through 19. So why do we need foundations? Why do we worship? We hear a lot of expressions about worshiping the Lord, praising the Lord, and sometimes we don't understand uh, where it came from. It came right from the Bible. Why we should do something. Uh, my syllabus uh, is called Understanding Praise and Worship. And I entitled that syllabus Understanding because when we understand how to do something, we can make it applicable to our lives and do it better with an understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. So the scripture says, get wisdom, but also with wisdom, you get an understanding. Understanding is the best thing in the world. So I'm going to teach right out of my syllabus and I, I want to introduce you to the teaching today. Uh, why are we called to praise the Lord? Why is it important for praise to be uh, a ministry of emphasis. It has been de-emphasized over the years. Uh, many times people just give it certain uh, limited time for praise and worship to go for. Well, we're not gonna talk about just the ministry of it itself. Praise and worship is a lifestyle that's been ordained by God for every believer. Isaiah 43, 21 says, this people have I chosen for myself they shall show forth my praise. God chose us, beloveds, to praise him. He singled us out. He specially created us, created us and made us for worshiping him. And he is the focus. He is the object of our worship. So throughout the body of Christ, we have a mandate to worship. It's not an option. Let that sink in. It's not an option. When we read the Psalms in Psalm 149, uh, many of the Psalms says, praise the Lord is understood. Uh, the subject is understood. You praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let all the people of God praise him. Let the people praise thee, Psalm 67. Let the people praise thee, O God, and the earth shall yield her increase. So it's an exhortation for every last one of us, not the praise team, not just the choir, but every one of us to praise the Lord. So it is a mandate. It is a, a command. A mandate is a command to praise the Lord. This people, why? I've chosen for myself that they would show forth my praise. And then in Peter's epistle, he says that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Why? That we have been called to praise the Lord to bring forth the praises of him who has brought us out of darkness into light. So he's the one that's responsible for this covenant relationship. He brought us out. He is the focus. He is the object. He is the savior. So it stands to reason that he wants us to praise him. And he said, my glory, I won't give to another. God is jealous. <laughs> He is jealous. I'm not jealous of Lady Ronda, but hey, she, you know, I want her love definitely coming to me. She can't share her love with anybody. The intimate love that a husband and wife has, God is the same way. I uh, found the scripture in Exodus. I don't have time to go to it, but I just want to mention it. How he said, behold, the Lord thy God, who is jealous with the capital J simply saying that that's one of his names that we don't hear about a whole lot. Uh, we hear about the compound names that he's Jehovah Rapha, he's Jehovah Sidkenu, he's Jehovah Makadesh. But you don't hear that one much. He is jealous. Behold the Lord our God who is jealous, that's his name. 
is jealous with the small j, which means he's suspicious of another rival getting his praise, getting the glory that's supposed to come to him. I am jealous. Uh, he says, I'm jealous, which means that word means or has the connotation of being possessive. The Holy Spirit in us desires to possess our race. So it is mandated for us to worship God in spirit and in truth. And that mandate is from God who desires to be intimate with us. He wants a relationship that goes beyond the surface. He wants a, a relationship so that he can impart to us and give himself to us and those things that we need to live this life. So whenever God, amen, he wants worship in a greater sense, and this is gonna segue us or lead us into the teachings of foundations, where it came from, who was the first worshiper. He wants us to worship this way in a greater sense so that we can be a covering, that worship will cover him. Cover, how can we cover God? Covering for him as praise and worship covers the move of God. Wherever God is going, praise goes ahead of him. Whatever God is going to do, remember this, whatever God is going to do, praise goes ahead of him to signal the body of Christ as to the nature of his moving. Uh, Psalm, not Psalm, yes, uh, Isaiah 54. Sing, O barren, you who did not bear. What happens when she sings? He says, you're gonna break forth on the left and on the right. You're gonna break forth, stretch forth your tents. Uh, who was it? Hannah began to sing in her barrenness. And scripture says, after she began to sing and worship the Lord, she, she became pregnant with the prophet Samuel in her womb. But until she sang, her singing, her worshiping, opened her womb up, whereas before she had been barren. Come on, before God does something, he wants the atmosphere to be conducive for him to do it. He just wants to be praised. Hallelujah. Sing, sing. <laughs> so here we are. So according to Ezekiel 28, now that's my lead scripture, uh, and I'm just gonna give you kind of the history of it. Lucifer was the highly decorated, highly anointed cherub. He was an angel. He was called the anointed cherub who covers. What was his position? What was his job? He was the anointed cherub that covered the move of God. Everywhere God went in heaven, Lucifer went. Lucifer went out in front. He had, the scripture said he was the finished pattern. When the Lord created Lucifer to be the worship in heaven, to be the one who was a part even uh, of the hierarchy of heaven, he created him with every sound inside of him. Every sound, every instrument was inside his throat. The scripture called it tabrets. He said, I created you so in the beginning and you are the finished pattern. When God created him, uh, come on, the mold was done away with. Come on, this is what I want. This is how it's going to be. But what happened, Lucifer got lifted up in pride and we get that accounting from uh, Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. How what the mighty fallen? He was lifted up. He said, I will ascend up in heaven. I will ascend up to the most high. He wanted the throne of God. And the Lord released him out, threw him out, kicked him out of heaven. So to replace him, God needed not another angel, but he needed a spirit. And who are we? We are living, breathing spirits. I want man, so we have become the leader of worship in the earth realm. So this is about the genesis of worship. So then Lucifer was called the anointed cherub. He covered the move of God. Um, if we look in history and study the history of the church, uh, we can begin to study and see how God began to move in those days. Uh, when there was going to be a new season, when there was going to be a, a, a new um, 
disposition, a new millennium, a new time when God was introducing something new, he always began to affect the music, change the music. New songs begin to come forth, songs that we had never heard before, songs that would introduce us uh, if it was even like the teaching of the Wesley brothers on sanctification. You heard songs that dealt with sanctification that began to be introduced for the first time. That's God signaling, uh, bringing signal to the body as to what he's about to do. So whatever God is going to do, he affects praise. The music affects the communications and the communications affect the music. So then God is affecting praise in this way so that he can bring forth and usher this last great end time revival. That's what through praise and through worship. You're part of that, whether you're part of a praise team, whether you're part of a worship team, you are a part of that end time call to worship. Out of Isaiah 43, 21, this people have I created for myself, not for the enemy. That's why I often teach and say that worship is not for Satan. Music is not for the devil. Worship is not for e even for entertainment. It is not for entertainment. It is for God. He's empowered it so that he could release himself and release things back upon us. Psalm 22 clearly and vividly tells us that he inhabits, O oh Lord, thou art enthroned upon the praises of Israel. That means his people. We are spiritual Israel. He's enthroned or he inhabits, meaning he comes where he is celebrated and he comes where he is loved, where he is worshiped. So if we're gonna be a part of this end time revival, we've got to get acquainted with Jesus, not only Jesus the intercessor, but Jesus the worshiper. He comes from the tribe of Judah, the praising tribe. He's on the right end of the Father. Somebody said, well, I know scripture says he's praying. Yes, he prayed. No, he not only prays, but he worships. He's the lion out of the tribe of Judah. So we have to acquiesce to this lifestyle of worship in the presence of God uh, and that we may adhere to this instruction. Let all the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people and the earth shall yield her increase. There are certain things that we will never obtain unless we're praising God this way. So let me uh, uh, touch a few more things and get into it, get with it. First Peter 2 and 9 and 10 talks about the fact that the tabernacle in the royal priesthood of God, uh, we are part of that priesthood. Exodus 19 and 6 and says, Jesus, when they came out of uh, Egypt, he says to the children of Israel, you shall be unto me or you shall be for me or unto me a kingdom a kingdom a priest that you're going to praise me then peter says you are a royal priesthood that you show forth show forth is demonstrating the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into light so we are to demonstrate that's one of the uh, uh in our mission statement, our ministry statement, and our vision. Our mantra is that we are called to demonstrate praise and worship in the last days. Amen. So uh, we must understand, and my prayer for the body of Christ is simply that through teaching, and that's what we're bringing you this conference, to impart information, to bring forth revelation to teach hallelujah my god and to demonstrate what god has called us to do this is our vision we're called to do this my prayer is that through teaching and training we would understand that worship is not just singing choruses and songs that's not just that's not worship and spiritual songs 
it's, it isn't just lifting up the hands. Mm -hmm. It's not just the playing of musical instruments. It's not just bowing down on our knees, amen. Worshiping God in this manner is just a small part. It is, it is legitimate, it's a part of worship, but it's a small part, beloveds. It's a small part of our lives, but worship is the demonstration of our love to the Lord on a daily basis. And what would that be? Lifestyle. If we're dedicating our life, loving the Lord every day, we're living and we're uh, amalgamating to a lifestyle of worship. So my hope is that through this teaching today, it's gonna to be helpful to everybody in the body of Christ. Okay, Genesis, the Genesis of praise and worship. The origin is, is in heaven. Lucifer was called the anointed cherub who covers or that covers cherub being an angel, an angelic being. He was part of the hierarchy of heaven where you had father, son, Holy Spirit, um, cherubim, seraphim, cherubim, uh, might, uh, virtues. That was part of the hierarchy. I could go on and on. But the fact that he had a distinguishable position he had a high position. Most times, you know, people think, well, that praise and worship is a small part of service. It should never be minimized. It should never be labeled as a small part because guess what? God says he inhabits it. If he's going to be enthroned, which means I'm going to come down when you praise me this way because uh, I created you for such. Hallelujah. <laughs> I live inside of your praises. Healing will come down. Deliverance will come down. He's enthroned in heaven. He's enthroned in the earth. Three places he's enthroned. And he's enthroned in the hearts of men. So when we enthrone him, build his throne in the earth, God will come down. We're praying for deliverance. We're praying for uh, healing of nations. Right now, we're in the midst of something called a pandemic. Amen. As much as we're praying, we need to be praising and worshiping as much because some things, even in Jehoshaphat's time, they had an enemy nation, three enemy nations that had come against them. And when they're getting ready to pray, when they're trying to pray, they ask God to help. God speaks to an in-house prophet to tell them, listen, you don't need to fight. You don't need to fight. The battle belongs to God. And he says, listen, send the praises out, get the praises out because they are to go before the army. So God wants to answer by praise. So in his purpose in the heavens, uh, in the beginnings, what was Lucifer's purpose? Number one was to bless God. What do we do when we bless God? I say in my syllabus that his position was one to cover and what does covering do? It's enabling God. Now, wait a minute. Does God need any help? No. But God established some things for himself. I chose you for myself. Praise is for myself. It's not for you to just feel good. It's for myself to do my purposes in the earth. So he's called to bless God. Everywhere God goes in heaven, he's blessing him. Uh, in him was not only sound, but light, his name simply meant shining one, son of the morning, shining one. So he was filled with light to fill the heavens. So his position was to bless God. Let me give you this scripture, Psalm 50 and verse 23. Uh, whoso offers praise, whoever, whoso offers praise glorifieth me, said the Lord. And he who orders his conversation aright, I will show him the salvation of my God. Salvation there is power. Whoso offers praise, whoso blesses God, God's response is going to be, I'm going to show my power wherever I am being praised. So 
His, his number one purpose was to bless God. Secondly, it was to send messages. Come on. Remember I said that worship affects the communications and the communications affects the worship. Uh, I did a message one time releasing um, uh, the sound, uh, taking off the limits, the limits of God. The sound, there's a sound that comes from God when we praise him this way. Uh, how did those songwriters know how to write songs about different movements that God ordained and orchestrated? The sound came from God. As they sought the Lord, God began to affect the communications. Even David uh, wrote most of the songs. David would write what he saw. He would write what he heard and his lyrics became so powerful that even when he took over as king over both nations and they came together, Israel and Judah, his worship became the lyrics of the nation. He communicated to the people by his worship because every time decisions, listen, major decisions were to be made, David would go into the presence, oh, I'm about to get happy. He would go into the presence of the Lord. We need not be baffled about anything, people, because we have a vehicle that transports us mm, right into the presence of the Lord. And what does the scripture say? Uh, in the presence of the Lord. I'm supposed to be teaching. I'm feeling a little preachy right now. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy and at his right hand are what pleasures evermore god wants to pleasure us mm. he wants to pleasure us as we come into his presence so yes he he wants us to understand the power of our worship to him in heaven but it's for himself so we come into the presence and God begins to respond. God begins to bring answers. God, God begins to release himself. So he's sending messages. God affected. Whoso offers praise glorifies. And I will show you my power. The third thing that his purpose was in heaven is that to he was to cover the move of God everywhere God went. Everywhere God is going, praise will go. God will not go anywhere without his praise. You need to write that down. He will not go anywhere without his praise. I don't want to be a part of a ministry or church that doesn't emphasize praise and worship. I don't want to be a part of a church where the presence of the Lord is not there. Uh, prophets many times could not prophesy until a minstrel came and set the atmosphere. Can you imagine uh, apostles, pastors, teachers, uh, evangelists, uh, God giving you a word and the environment is not right and you can't release, um, you, you come to a stalemate, something is wrong, uh, you feel the presence of the enemy. Well, you need the atmosphere changed and praisers change the atmosphere. And I'm not just talking about musicians now, even in your house, come on, uh, as I've traveled many years and preached uh, across the country and gone to different places, I can remember when my children were small, I could be on the road uh, doing what was called back then uh, uh, crusades of uh, revival services and come back home and feel something not right in my house. Feel the air, something in the air. Sometimes you can sense when uh, the schemes of the adversary have been arrayed against you. That's the time to change the atmosphere. And sometimes I would come straight into the house. And sometimes the, 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 uh, the thought that I need to get on my knees and pray. And the Lord would say, go to the piano late at night and begin to just praise the Lord. Or not even play, just stand in the middle of the floor and begin to give God worship. And begin to worship until that atmosphere was changed. So covering the move of God, God will not go anywhere without his praise, okay? What was Lucifer's position? His position, 
He was on, the scripture says in Ezekiel 28, he was upon the holy mountain of God. I use that to teach that praise and worship have priority in the economy of God. God does not minimize the importance. He will never, amen. So you can't put it on the back burner. It is not something that's used as a preliminary. It is not something where I'll do it only when I go to church. No, 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 no. It's not optional. This people have I chosen for myself. If you really want to have some quality time with God, uh, let me give you another, another one of my quotes that says it best for me. Um, private devotion leads to public worship. I don't go to church to worship. I'll say it again. I don't go to church to worship. I go to church because I am a worshiper. I worship at home. I'm called for him. I'm called to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and to go into his courts with praise. I'm called to honor and respect the protocol of praise and worship to, to come in. Come on, he invites us. He created us for himself, so he has the right. Listen, he has the right to call us in and expect us to come in at any time. Uh, it's, it's like uh, praise and worship in my syllabus. I say that it's compared to marital love, marital relationship. Oh, hallelujah. If Mrs. Deloach was here, <laughs> She could tell you, uh, Paul says it best. Now, don't, don't y'all start laughing, but Paul teaches it about that the, the, the wife doesn't have power over her own body. Neither does the husband have power. And they come together at one's request and call the same thing. Whoever is responsible, God created us. He has the right to call his praise for. He has the right to expect us to be in his presence. Uh, Mark chapter, oh, I think it's three. Oh, God, I love it. I've talked to the congregation. I've, I stumbled upon when Jesus, amen, had his disciples around him before he sent them out to preach, teach, or do anything, or minister. And sometimes we're so anxious to minister. Let me tell you this, fivefold ministry people, uh, congregants, and this is for all the body. We can be too anxious to go and minister and have not spent time with the Lord. Mm, it's in my foreword, in my syllabus, how that we are to uh, come into his presence first. Come on. We have nothing to give to anybody until we've been in the presence of the Lord and been empowered by him. What do you have to, if you haven't had your ear on his mouth? If you haven't been in his presence to know his secrets, come on, whoso offers praise, glorify me. And if he orders his conversation right, he said, I'm going to show him the power of my God. Come on. He even says in a place that he would reveal his secrets. The secret things belong to God, but the revealed things become ours. How does God reveal secrets when we come into his presence. Mm. Hallelujah. Come, come up higher. Mm. Revelation, come up higher. He invited Moses to come up and Moses wanted to come up, come up. And he says in Revelation to come up higher, come up in his presence so he can unveil, he can reveal things heretofore that we've never heard of before. How do we get them? We only get them in his presence. Yes, so he's upon the holy mountain of God. He's in a place of priority. He, he's secondly on, uh, he's the only one, he's the second only to the Godhead. Mm. Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then you had Lucifer, the anointed cherub who covered. Yes, come on. Yeah, his name was Lucifer, shining one. He wasn't devil. He was kicked out of heaven. Until he, you know, he got lifted up in pride. And let me just say this now. It is for God. What, what keeps me grounded? 
what keeps me understanding that I'm not, I'm not <laughs> doing the work. I'm just a vessel that he works through. I'm a vessel of anointing that he placed anointing in. I'm called to worship him like everybody else is. And then as God begins to do things as a result of our worship, we're not to claim credit for it. Amen. So he was on the holy mountain. He was second to the Godhead. And then he would go before or ahead of the army. Glory to God. Praise goes before the army. Judah. Judah in Genesis, we find when uh, Judah was given his name, his distinction, you are the one that your brothers will praise. You are the one who will have your hand on the neck of your enemy. So then he was, was sent before the army. Okay, let me wrap it up. He was the leader of praise and worship in Ezekiel as well. What stood out? His creation. How was he created? He was created with everything he needed to worship God the way we are sharing this morning. He was created with special attributes. Um, his, his covering, his garment. Remember in Isaiah where the scripture says, for the spirit of heaviness, put on the garment of praise, Lucifer was endowed with a special co covering that had all kind of precious stones on that covering. And beloved, the emerald stone, the emerald stone was uh, emblematic. It was representative of worship. Amen. Uh, it's like the priest when he would put on the ephod that in his robe he had uh, over his chest the names of every tribe and it, it was it, it, full of decor uh, representing the presence of the Lord in his people. So Lucifer was decorated. He was highly decorated. How can we uh, cheapen praise and worship? How can we minimize it and make it um, minimal when it's highly decorated in heaven? God speaks out of his presence. If we want to hear God, we got to get in his presence. Isaiah 2 talks about, um, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Why? Because out of the presence of the Lord, he's going to speak. He's going to speak. Sometimes we don't need to counsel. Sometimes we don't need to have the pastor counsel. We don't need to just talk about everything. Sometimes we just need to spend some time worshiping God. Uh, sometimes I'll use the expression, uh, two-word expression, just worship. <laughs> uh, I put something out there the other day, just worship on Facebook, just worship. Sometimes we just need to just worship because he says, I live inside your worship. I live inside your praise. So he was created in a special way. He had special attributes. Uh, any song, any adoration that God wanted in heaven, he would just turn to Lucifer and he would release it. Can you imagine opening your mouth? And he had, according to scripture, he had perfect pitch. He wasn't trying to get up to the, no, <laughs> he had perfect pitch. He had authority, amen. In this foundational, he had, in this foundational teaching, we find that Lucifer had authority. What else did the scripture say in Genesis about Judah? The scepter, mm, the scepter shall not depart mm, from between your feet until Shiloh comes. The scepter will not depart. Come on, the ruling rod of authority. Who was Jesus? He was called the son of David. Mm. He had the keys of David. Hallelujah, my God. He came not from Levi, the tribe of Levi. He came out of the tribe of Judah 
praise. That's why he's called the Lion of Judah. He's a praiser now. He's sitting on the right hand of God, praising. Yes. So authority is in this praise. Authority was in the foundations and his authority is in our praise today. Praise would literally bring down strongholds. This kind of praise and worship will bring down and even shake nations and move out demons. Somebody said, well, no, you know, you don't, you don't cast out demons through praise and worship. I beg to differ. Come on. It's happened in my ministry. I talked not long ago in one of our um, Chenanaya gatherings, one of our worship gatherings, David was called to come to the throne, come to the kingdom of Saul when the scripture said God had put or allowed an evil spirit to come upon Saul. And when they looked for, when they looked for, come on, said it last night in my message, when they looked for someone, they suggested, let's find out and get a minstrel, somebody who can play skillfully, somebody who can, and refresh our king. Well, not any old somebody would do. And one subject in the kingdom spoke out and said, I know such a person, he's a lad. And his description of him, he says, he's, 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 uh, he's ruddy, he's good, he looks good, he's easy on the eyes, he's handsome, come on. Woo! Not that everybody's gonna be, you know, fit that mold, but hey, we all look good in the sight of the Lord because he didn't create anything that's shabby. Everything looks good, amen. Everything is perfect in God's eyes, but he looks good. He's good looking and it describes him as a man of war. How is it he's so young? He had not fought in any battle. He had not been to anybody's war, but yet when the anointing came upon him, when he worshiped from his worship experience and what caused him to have such strength, he, we talking about worshiping warriors. Remember the theme? Come on, worshiping warriors, establishing the kingdom. When David would worship, he was empowered by God to do anything. And then a lion and a bear came out to threaten the sheep. And David, even in his gentleness to worship the Lord, praise leaders, come on, worship people. We're gentle because we understand and we can sense the presence of the Lord and our hearts are pliable. Our hearts have been broken, a broken in a contrite spirit. God will not despise or reject. But when it comes to war, we should love worship first. The worshipers went before the army, which says to us, love worship, but go to war when it's necessary. When the enemy came, David took another attitude, a disposition. He literally began to kill the bear and uh, uh, the, the lion and ripped their heads off and took the lion by the mane and began to destroy him. That's a warlike men, a, a, a mentality of a warrior. Blessed be the Lord, my strength. Psalm 144, 1 and 2, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. He could fight with his fingers, but he also could take his hands and destroy an enemy. That's power. That's authority. His garment was special. Lucifer's garment was special. And then his dominion, he had been given dominion. We have dominion in praise. We have dominion. Let me give you a scripture that can coincide with that. Psalm 67. Am I communicating? I hope I'm communicating this morning. I hope you're receiving. Psalm 67 says this. Let all there, let the people rather praise thee, O God. Yes, yea, let all the people praise thee. I look at that scripture as a command. <laughs> Don't hinder the people from praising you. Let them praise. Mm. My pastor used to say years ago when the presence of the Lord broke out and we'd break out and young people and I was directing the choir, didn't have the revelations on praise that I have now, but we'd have a move of the spirit of God. And he get up and say, hey, <laughs> and then the, he, he quote the scripture out of the prophet that says, uh, hallelujah. He said, then 
shall the virgin go forth in the dance and the old and the young shall rejoice together. And he started dancing. He had a little skip and dance. He started dancing. He said, let the virgin come forth and the old and the young shall rejoice together. Yes, everybody is supposed to praise. So yes, there is dominion. He says, let all the people praise thee. And what's going to happen? And then the earth, the earth will yield, give up her increase. Praise will cause, amen, <laughs> with this power, with this dominion, the earth to be given up to us. We can possess territory. That's kingdom. Come on, ruling dominion. He gave power and dominion to Adam in the garden. You have dominion. You don't have to take it. You already have it. He says, come on, be fruitful, multiply. He says, subdue. Come on, make it what you want it to be. And then he says, have dominion. You have it. It's been transferred. So here, praise brings us into the reality of our dominion. And the earth shall yield her increase. I'm still in Psalm 67. Then he goes on to say, yes. <laughs> and then our God, even our God. Can somebody just lift your hands up and praise God with me? When we praise God says, there will be a response. Come on. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. There will be a response. I'm trying to think of that song. Uh, there, will, uh, there will be a performance. The angel told Mary, there's going to be a performance of the thing that I spoke to you. And Mary sang. <laughs> And she became impregnated. But the performance is going to come when we're praising God this way because we have dominion. Then our God's going to come. He's going to bless us. And he says one more time, yeah, let the earth praise thee. Let all the people rather praise thee. He says it morning one time for emphasis. And the earth, in the earth shall give up. We will have dominion because of our authority. Let me let me come to the end of these attributes here, and I want to touch something else uh, if I have time to. Amen. Uh, his dominion, his anointing, his anointing. He was anointed for worship. He was anointed as a worshiper. He was anointed. All of these things, the power, the authority. That's why David could do what he did. He was anointed for worship. He was anointed to be a warrior. He was anointed to be like God. Moses even revealed to us in Exodus 15, uh, or verse, verse three, he says that God is a man of war. They described David as a man of war. My God, he, said, he is loving. He's not just this loving God only, uh, just uh, meek and lowly at heart. But Moses told us, he was the first one that told us that God is a man of war. God takes out his enemies. That's what a worshiping warrior, David, anytime he saw that there was a threat to the ways of the kingdom of God, he put on, he would take off. <laughs> you know, I don't, just, you know, you can take off your clothes in the spirit realm. You can take off one mindset and put on another mindset. And that mindset was to destroy each enemy that confronted the kingdom of God. And David had the same distinction that Jesus Christ shared. Jesus, as the last Adam, defeated the final enemy of death. David, before he died, the scripture said that, I like how he says it even in Acts, David died. <laughs> uh, but Jesus goes on <laughs> and has a position on the right hand. David defeated every enemy that he ever came up against. So we have dominion and we have the anointed. Somebody say, I'm anointed for this. I'm anointed for this. And then his fall, Lucifer failed because he was lifted up in pride and nothing else. And when he was thrown out of heaven, the place of worship in heaven was vacated. To tell you what God thinks about praise, he will not have 
the throne of praise and worship. He will not have that position vacated. And I said earlier, who did he put there? He put us there. We are now the leaders of praise and worship. I'm not talking about at a church. <laughs> I'm not talking about at a designated place where you are, you are called the worship person. No, that's all of us, okay? Uh, he was perverted after he was thrown out of heaven and he came down to the earth and he perverted everything that he had been given and he was replaced. So now, those are the things I wanted to share about Lucifer. So what, did, what does that make us? What did, what does that carry us? What does that uh, challenge us to do? In our worship, we have purpose. So when we come together as a congregation, I said earlier that I don't go to church to worship. I go to church because I am a worshiper. It's part of my spiritual DNA. It's part of my calling. I have been called as a kingdom, a part of a kingdom of worshipers. I've been called, thank you, uh, Apostle Peter. Uh, I'm a royal priesthood. Uh, the sons of Zadok were priests who were able because of their faithfulness to God to get closer to him, to be in the presence, to minister to the altar. Amen. They were faithful. So I want to give you some points and some truths that we need to hear concerning the purpose of our congregational worship. The vertical aspect of worshiping, what, is, what does vertical mean? What am I talking about? It's a straight up and down relationship with God, one on one. Wife and I share, and she always likes to say, um, um, when we worship God intimately, it's an audience of one. You're not worshiping for anybody else. You're not trying to please anybody else, You're not trying to please anybody else. Uh, none of those kinds of things, but it's an audience of one. So the vertical aspect is that worshipers communicate with the Lord. We communicate with him, amen. Uh, to minister unto the Lord, 2 Chronicles 5, 13 through 14. You know the story when Solomon had dedicated, had built the temple that his father, David, was not permitted to build because David had bloody hands and the Lord wanted a peaceful man, glory to God, to build the temple. Well, Solomon gathered the people on that great day to have such a gala, have such an occasion. And the scripture says, when the musicians and the singers all became as one as and to make one sound as in praising, they were ministering to the God and what happened? Remember, there's always going to be a divine response. The glory of God fell that day. Come on. The glory of God fell in that place on that day because when we come together as a corporate expression or corporate body, guess what? The manifest presence, when we become one, will begin to fall. Amen? Yes. So he came together and ministered unto the Lord. Second Chronicles 5 and 13 through 14. Okay? It's to realize the manifest presence, consciousness of the Lord. We are called to come together and worship God to realize the manifest presence of the Lord. Amen, I love it. Uh, so we're not just coming for any individual accolades. We're not coming just to get our praise on. But again, it's all for God, believers. It's all for God, amen. So to realize the manifest presence of God and to be, listen at this, a visible live witness of the presence. We're witnesses of his glory. Do you know something? When people come to our ministries, our churches to worship, perhaps you've invited somebody um, and they maybe are not used to 
uh, the way we worship or the worship style. Maybe they've never been into a live worship setting before. Then what are we called to do? Just be ourselves and worship God. Acknowledging God is going on sometimes. Um, uh, confession of God's names is going on where we're just uh, uh, talking about who God is. A song may come forth, an old congregation walking the floor. We used to walk the floor, uh, and we still do at times in our ministry, just talking about who God is, speaking all his names. You know, no music going yet. We're just praising God. Amen. Lifting up who is to, to praise us to lift up the virtues, virtues of something or someone. Lift up the virtues of something or someone. In this case, God, we're talking about his virtue, talking about his goodness. We're talking about his power. We're talking about his authority. Listen, so we become witnesses of the presence and somebody that comes into the congregation will want to know the Lord. They hear you talking about God being a healer and the healing anointing suddenly is released in that place. Many can get healed in a worship service. Wow, okay. So then we are called to worship God congregationally, amen, to provide an atmosphere or a seedbed for the gifts of God to come forth inside the congregation. Let me give you uh, um, an example. Elisha, the prophet, was called by Jehoshaphat in the league of kings. They were getting ready to go up against uh, an evil army into a battle. And in those days, prophets wanted to know what seers had seen or what could they tell them about the battle. Guess what? The prophet Elisha refused to prophesy. His spirit was vexed when he saw in the coalition an evil king that disturbed him. And he said, bring me a minstrel. Need this atmosphere changed. Bring me a minstrel. And as the minstrel came, as soon, I love this. <laughs> he didn't have to wait all day. As soon as the minstrel began to touch, woo, that, that tells me one thing. The minstrel had been living in the presence of the Lord. He didn't have to come and get ready. Come on. We don't have to come and get ready to hear a favorite song. Remember, we are in private devotion. We are in worship at home before we go to the uh, congregated place. Amen. He came as soon as he began to touch the instrument and the, release the songs. The Bible says, the prophet said, thus said the Lord and the prophetic word was released. Hallelujah. We are a floodgate to release the words of God. Well, I'm about, about to, to the end of my time. My time is about up. It's been a pleasure teaching today. I hope you received something and uh, stay tuned. I'm going to be back tomorrow. Amen. Teaching on, hallelujah, the Chenaniah anointing. God bless you. Thank you.